Good morning, folks. I'm Scott Kemp. I'm one of the elders here. Uh, it's my, uh, I was going to say task, it's my glory, it's my joy to come up and teach this morning. Uh, it's about a topic that I think is really interesting and cool, and uh, because I am a nerd is the reason I think that, probably. Uh, let me start with a quick prayer, all right? Let's do that. Thank you, God, for today, for the rain you sent us. We know that's what makes things grow. It's been a lot of rain lately, and when sometimes we want sunshine, but we thank you for the rain because you sent it. Thank you for the people that are here, for the stories that we're going to hear today, for the lessons from you that we're going to hear today. I just pray that they would enter our hearts and our minds in a way that lets us understand you better so that we can glorify you better as we grow. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. I do a lot of uh, uh, substitute teaching for adult Sunday school classes, adult Bible study classes. We're not supposed to call them adult Sunday school anymore. I keep... And I typically start the same way. I'm going to do a little different. I typically start by saying, okay, we're going to do this. Open the floor up first. Any question on any topic that you want to ask an elder, I'm an elder, you can ask me. Okay, and we'll, we'll, do, we'll answer those questions for as long as we want to. I've got a lot of stuff to cover today, and if I don't get it covered adequately, then the next guy up is going to bind. So I'm not going to do that today. Instead, I'm going to tell you how many elders are there in the room. If you're an elder, stand up or raise your hand. There's three of us. There's also W.O. Elmore and Blake White and Samuel Moroni. And Samuel will be here in a minute, I know. Uh, ask us any question you want. If, it's, if it has to do with uh, Dak Prescott and Ezekiel Elliott, then the answer to all will be short. But you can ask the question. If you don't know who Dak Prescott and Ezekiel Elliott are, then ask an adult male sitting near you. Because they know. I did. He didn't know? <laughs> he's, not, he's not from around these parts originally then. Uh, they are the, uh, the, the, the core of the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, and that's really all I know about. Anyway, so any question on any topic, ask, one, ask me later. I don't have time right now, or I would do it right now. Normally, I do that. I take all the time, and it's really in enjoyable and, and, and valuable. But i got stuff to cover that I really can't afford to do that right now. So ask one of us anytime you want to, between any time. <laughs> Two weeks ago, we, uh, had a, we heard from Cody. Uh, the, 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 the quick synopsis of it is that Scripture is inerrant, infallible, and sufficient for everything you need for life and godliness. That's the bottom line from two weeks ago. Last week, we talked more about who God was and that God has, re God has revealed himself to us through Scripture intentionally and purposefully. We got a lot on that last week. We're going to get more on that this time about specifically how God has revealed himself to us and what that revelation is in specific areas. I'm going to do it a little differently than I've ever seen it done before because I got some education in the last six months that I've never had before, and it's going to be valuable, I think, for this lesson. I'll get to that in a minute. We're going to talk about attributes of God today, uh, that he is immutable. You got some of that last time, too. It means he's consistent, reliable, and faithful, that he is eternal. And I want to talk about what eternal means. Uh, eternal does not mean just he'll go on forever and he's gone on forever. To me, eternal means that God is outside of time. Think about this a minute. In the beginning, God created all this stuff. It doesn't just mean that he created the matter. I think it means that he created the space-time continuum. That before God created this, uh, length and width and height and time did not exist. God lives outside of all that. Make sense? It's hard, to, it's hard to grasp. In fact, I don't know if you can. I don't know if humans can grasp it, which is another cool thing about God, that humans can't grasp it. God lives outside of that. Let me talk a minute about infinity. A quick digression. I'm a mathematician, by the way. I don't know if you guys know that. Some of you do. Uh, I said I was a nerd. Mathematics and physics are my thing. Infinity in, in mathematics means if you start counting, you never quit counting. Okay? That's infinite. There are an infinite number of in integers, right? You start counting integers, you never get to the end. But there are 
bigger infinities than that because there's negative integers too. So there's twice as many integers as you think. Twice as many integers as you can start counting that way and never get to the end. You can start counting that way and never get to the end. Also, I can show you if I had time that there are, an, there are at least as many fractions between 0 and 1 as there are integers. Okay? At least as many. There are more fractions between 0 and 1 than there are integers. Also between 1 and 2, between 2 and 3, between 3 and 4, between infinite and negative. So there's an infinite number of infinities in numbers. Okay? There are more irrational numbers than there are rational numbers. An infinite number more irrational numbers than all rational numbers. So you have orders of infinity. You can just count, you can, get, you can get, it's beyond your ability to really grasp how big infinity can be. God's like that, okay? That doesn't adequately describe God, but God is like that. However big you think God is, you cannot comprehend how big he really is. However much power you think he has, you cannot comprehend how much power you think he really has. People say, oh, when I get to heaven, it'll be great because I'll know everything then, right? Let me tell you, after you've been in heaven a hundred million years, God will still be so much infinitely more than you that you cannot grasp it. Okay? God is not merely like us, only more. He's totally different than us. He's bigger, he's better in a way that we can't comprehend, and that's a good thing. You don't want a God that you can comprehend. You would much rather serve a God that is much more than you can possibly handle, much more than you can possibly understand. If you think I'm just making this up, I need two volunteers. <laughs> Isaiah 55, another volunteer. Psalm 139. Isaiah 55, we're going to read verses 8 and 9. I am unable to hold a view of God that is high enough. You got Psalm 139? Psalm 139, read verse 6 and then verse 17 and 18. Yes, please. Okay, he's saying it's such knowledge, knowledge of God is too high for me. I cannot, I cannot, I cannot. More than the sand, I cannot. It's just, that's all I got. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. How much higher is outer space than here, than that, than that ceiling? How far can you go in outer space? You can, you can, you can never, you can, if you could have enough, enough motor, you'd never stop. You go for an infinite number of eons, and you still would have as far to go as you have right now. That's how much higher God's ways are than our ways. I'm telling you, you cannot comprehend it. Normally, I say, I'll, and I'm going to say it here sometimes, I've got one thing. Okay, When I start, first started teaching, I had like a list of, of eight things. And I realized that next Sunday I came back, they didn't know any of them. I said, okay, we'll try three things. I, I came back the next Sunday, they didn't know any of them. Now it's one thing. But, it, but if I had two things, this would be the second one. <laughs> God is bigger than you can imagine. You should be humble. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought because God is bigger than you can possibly even imagine. Okay. And that's a good thing. Now, specific attributes of God. First, I want to talk about the unity of God. God is one. God's character is unified. Uh, there is no other. Somebody, I need another volunteer. I need, in fact, I need uh, three volunteers. John, uh, Deuteronomy 6.4. Uh, James 1.17, if you haven't memorized, that's okay. And the third one, Exodus 34, 6 and 7. There's one God, there is no other. 
Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He claims to be, there's only one of them, okay? God's character is unified. It's not like you take each of his attributes and like building blocks, like Legos, and you put them <laughs> together and you got a Lego God there. It's not, it's not like that. He, each part of him partakes of each of his attributes. His attributes fill out the whole. There's another elder you can ask. Just walk in the door. Raise your hand. There's another one. He knew I was going to say that. Uh, God's character is unified. He doesn't have a good side and a bad side. He is one in essence. He is indivisible. You can't take him apart. You can, because he is beyond our ability to understand, we can only learn things about him that are valuable to us to know. They're useful to us to know. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. But don't think it's we're taking him apart because he's take apartable. He's, he's not. He's one God. He's indivisible. Uh, his attributes are always there and always consistent. James 1.17. It does not change. He's, he's, he's the same always. Uh, the shadows, when the, when the light spins, when the, when the things move, the shadows change. God's there. Each of his attributes is completely true of God, his character. They're not parts of God that combine to make the whole. Uh, Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Okay, God is merciful and gracious, forgiving. And over here he is uh, wrathful and, and condemning. In, this, in the same section of scripture, the same two verses. Those two things appear in that verse to go together, right? Because they're, they're, God is, God is, God is, and yet he is not, and yet he is, and yet his wrath and his mercy do not contradict one another. We're going to see that a little bit more in a little bit, but each of God's attributes that would appear to not go together actually merge together in a way that is really beautiful. That's going to be the one thing when we get there. I'll get there in a minute. Because God is not just one. God is also triune. He is a trinity. And studying the trinity is, is the part of this that really opened my eyes. You think the trinity is one of those mysteries I tell people there are very few real mysteries in the world, and none of them have to do with auto mechanics or home remodeling. But the Trinity is a mystery. We cannot grasp it fully. We have all kinds of, uh, of examples, all kinds of an analogies about what the Trinity is, uh, but we don't get it fully. All the analogies fall short. They almost all uh, partake of what I would call modalism, which is a heresy that means that God sometimes acts one way and sometimes acts another way. He sometimes acts like the Father. Sometimes act like the Spirit. God does not sometimes do one thing and sometimes do another. He's the same always, and he's always three persons. Uh, but that's the best analogy we got, and it falls way short. Modalism is not what you want to do. Instead, you want to understand what you can about each of God's persons and apply that to your life in a way that makes sense, knowing that you cannot understand it all. God is three. So, uh, I use the, the example, the uh, definition that Wayne Grudem, who is kind of the guy that wrote the book that we're using, uh, gave out for, for the Trinity. In one sense, the doctrine of the Trinity is a mystery that we will never be able to understand fully. However, we can understand something of its truth by summarizing the teaching of Scripture in three statements. God is three persons. Each person is fully God. There is one God. It seems to be self-contradictory. And yet it's not. It can't be because God doesn't change. God doesn't contradict. And we know that. We just know we can't fully understand him. So there's one God in three persons. Each one of them is fully God. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is neither the Father nor the Son. I don't fully understand that. But there it is. I'm going to skip part of my notes here because I think I'm running out of time. Somebody got a clock back there? Tell me when it's like, uh, what time am I supposed to be done? I'm supposed to be done at 10.15.
10, 15? Tell them when it's 10 o'clock, okay? Cody's going to do that. Uh, so what we do is we accept the trusted source. We accept the scripture. I'll go ahead and do the digression I was going to do. Epistemology, because it's important, I think. How do you know something? How do you normally accept something to be true? I think people normally accept things to be true one of two ways. Number one, it matches your uh, understanding of reality. How do you know that one and one is two? Take one thing, you take one thing, you put them together. Yeah, there's two things there. I can, I can, it doesn't, happens every time that way. Every time I take one thing and another thing and put them together, that's two. So I agree, I believe that one and one is two because it matches my perception of reality. Uh, and you can expand that and you get all of mathematics. And you can believe it's true because it's based on things that match your perception of reality. The other way you know something is true is because it comes from a trusted source. Bottom line, my mother told me so, so I believe it. How does the source become trusted? Your mother becomes trusted because she's your mother. Normally, though, a source becomes trusted because it has been right many times. Uh, that's the way scripture is a trusted source for me. I have tested it. It's been right many times, and so I trust it as, a, as its source. I encourage you to, to test it to see if you think it's a trusted source as well. I think you'll come from, if, you, if you honestly test it, you'll believe it is. So how do you know things are true? Because Scripture says they're true because it's a trusted source. Or because how do you know Scripture is true? Because it is it has matched perceived reality exactly over and over and over again. It is predicted, it is explained, it is described in a way that nothing else can do. When I was in college, I, I did a systematic investigation of a lot of that stuff a lot of other philosophies, and I encourage you to do that uh, because it just cemented my faith, cemented my ability to believe in Christ. People say to me, oh, you just have faith because you have some, no, it's not because of some mystical experience. I have faith because I've tried everything else. This is the one that makes sense. Maybe not everything, but a lot of other things. That's the end of that digression. There's not an adequate analogy for the Trinity. Many, many, many things try. You get to think about the egg, you think about the, the man being a, a father and a son and a, and a husband, all those things fall short. So what we can do is learn about the Trinity, what the Scripture says about it, and use that as we can. So let's look at what the Scripture says about the Trinity. First you have to understand is the word Trinity is never in Scripture. It's not found there. However, the doctrine is, the concept is, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are both mentioned, are all mentioned in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, I need four volunteers. John 1, 1 to 4. If you have it memorized, you can just quote it. Uh, Titus 2, 13. Two more. Russell, Ephesians 1. I'm sorry, that's, that's later. Uh, back to Psalm 139. And one more. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2. 10 to 14. John 1, 1 to 4. Ready? Yeah. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the light was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now go down and read verse 14 as well. I think it's 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So at the first part it says, in the beginning was the word. And the word made everything. And, and then in verse 14 it says, and the word became flesh. So who's it talking about? It's talking about the son. It's talking about Christ. Very clear in the New Testament that Christ, Jesus, is God. Okay? Uh, Titus 2. Titus 2, 13, yeah. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. New Testament is clear that Jesus is God. Uh, Psalm 139, verse 7. The Spirit of God is omnipresent. Can't go anywhere 
When I was a kid, this is another quick digression. When I was a kid, I memorized Psalm 139. I encourage it. It's still my favorite piece of poetry ever, Psalm 139, the whole chapter. It's not hard to do, especially if you're young. <laughs> the Spirit of God, the Spirit is, is God also, Psalm 139, Old Testament. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 14. Ten to four, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Five verses. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is how we understand who God is. It's clear that that's two different entities there, two different persons, and yet they're both God. If you look at the baptism of Christ, which is Matthew three sixteen, Matthew three, uh, you all heard this one before. That both the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son are all there in one time. There's three different persons there, but there's still just one God. Uh, and uh, for me, though, the key, and if you have a proof text verse, it's Matthew 28, 18, and 19. Anybody got that one memorized? Another good one to memorize. Somebody look that one up for me. Matthew 28, 18, and 19. You'll recognize it when she reads it. You got it memorized? That's, that's that 19. You got to have 18 as well. Oh, sure, go ahead. <laughs> Teaching them to observe all the things, all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Right. Commonly known as the Great Commission. Uh, you see the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit there, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's, it's what we do. Everything we do is about the Trinity. It's important stuff. Uh, in fact, it's so important that it doesn't, I mean, I don't have time to go into full detail, all of it. A lot of what I'm going to say next, particularly, was informed by a particular book that I read just lately called Delighting in the Trinity. I recommend it. I recommend it so highly that I brought two copies of it to give away. Raise your hand if you want that. Come get it. I'm crippled, man. This is what happens when somebody runs a stop sign right in front of you. Uh, delighting in the Trinity. Uh, it really changed my outlook on what the Trinity is in a way that you're fixing to hear right now because God is constant. He never changed. And that means even before he created space-time continuum, he's the same then as he is now. Okay? So if, if God is not a trinity, and he hasn't yet created the space-time continuum, he's lonely. He's the, only, he's the only thing there, right? Well, no, he's a trinity, so he's not lonely. He didn't create us to fulfill his need for companionship because he already had that perfect companionship in the trinity. He didn't need us for anything. Still doesn't need us for anything. He didn't create us so that he would have an outlet for his love because he already had an outlet for his love. The Trinity, they, could, they love each other perfectly in a way that we cannot really even comprehend. We can kind of see a shadow of it, but we can't really even comprehend it. So the love that Christ, that God shows to us is not something that he ginned up just after he made us. It's something that is an outgrowth of his love for the other parts of the Trinity. He didn't change. We do not fulfill a need for him. If we did, that would make us a whole lot more important to him 
than we in fact are because he had to have us in order to be fully God. No. Without the Trinity, that would be true. Or without the Trinity, we couldn't understand how that was any other way. But with the Trinity, we can understand at some level how God can be omnipresent through time and eternity, uh, omniscient, uh, immutable, not ever-changing, completely loving, completely fulfilled within himself, even before he created the space-time continuum and the earth and all of us. That, that, did it kind of, did your head hurt a little bit? <laughs> Mine does, and I've been studying this for like six months. Uh, but it's a good hurt because, again, it's the kind of God you want to serve, the kind of God that's, that's bigger than you can possibly even imagine. Each one of his attributes needs to be understood in the light of that concept, I think, that, that because God is Trinity, he is complete, he is whole. My one thing, okay, I told you it was going to be one thing, this is it. Sound big enough, like a big enough one thing, like a bigger one thing than the other one? Was that just how huge God is? The fact that God is Trinity is key to understanding all these attributes that we're fixing to talk about, which was really the, what I'm supposed to talk about the whole lesson. This, this has all been prologue so far, uh, if you will. God preexisted. God was Trinity. God was not lonely. He was not unable to love. He had someone to love. If God was a single person, we could not fully understand how he could love pre-creation. Uh, Ephesians 1, somebody look this up for me. Ephesians 1, who's going to read this? Okay, Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. 3 to 14. Right, stop after verse 5 or you're going to read the whole, all the way to 14. That's, through, that's five? That's verse four. Okay, go ahead and go on to five. Through five. In love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. Before the foundation of the earth. Before, what, what's the foundation? I think the space-time continuum could be considered the foundation of the earth. Before he created any of it, he had it in his mind to do it. He chose us. He had thought about all of this. He had figured it all out. It didn't take him long because time didn't exist. Wow. I mean, that's just, he chose us. He predestined us. He loved us. Okay, it shows that he had that ability before the foundation of the earth. Go ahead and read on through, the, through verse 14. Okay, I mean, it's, you either got to just leave it right there or talk about it for a couple of hours, right? I mean, God has done all this for us. He has done all this for himself for us. He's done all this in a way that I can't fully comprehend. He planned it out before he created time. Just wow. It's just, I, I got nothing. I, it's either just wow or it's, more than I can do in the next 45 minutes. So I'm just going to leave it at wow. Now let's talk about some more specific attributes of God, okay? Omniscience. God is all-knowing. God has perfect knowledge. 
Uh, I need uh, three volunteers. Uh, give me uh, 1 John 3.20. Somebody else. Matthew 11.21. One more. Matthew 6, 31 to 33. God's omniscience. He knows everything. Everything is more than you think. Just like infinity is bigger than you think it is, everything is more than you think it is. John, 1 John 3, 20. Russell. So whatever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. God knows everything. It's just, it's, God knows everything. Matthew eleven twenty one. 21. God even knows what would have happened if things had gone differently. If they, if they had repented, this is what would have happened. They didn't, so that's not what happened. But if they had, God even God not, not only knows everything, he knows everything that might have been if things had gone differently. Okay? Matthew 6, 31 to 33. Okay, don't worry about this stuff. God knows your future. He knows what you need. He's going to make sure that you get what you need in the way that glorifies him, and it's all going to be good. He created it. My inadequate analogy for this is of a guy driving down the road. I'm a guy driving down the road. I can remember where I've been. I can see where I'm at. I can see down the road in front of me a little bit, and the farther down the road I get, the less good my vision of it is, right? That's like me going through life. God is looking at the road map with me driving down it. He can see everywhere I've been, everywhere I'm going, what the traffic is like 10 miles ahead of me, 100 miles ahead of me. He can see it all. He can see what's off to the sides on the, on the roads that I can't go down. He can see what's off to the sides on places where there are no roads. He can see what's underneath the ground, what's above the He can see everything, things that I don't even have any desire nor, nor think I have any need to know about. He's got it all. That's how I think God, that's, that's the best uh, analogy I can have for how God views our time traveling through the earth, traveling through time and space. I can see what I can see. He can see everything that might have been, everything that I don't need to know, everything that has no effect on me, <coughs> might affect somebody else, might not. Doesn't, God's omniscient. Omniscient means more than you think it does. I probably haven't even explained it adequately. I think it even means more than that. God knew. Yeah. Uh, one of my, to, 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 to riff on that digression, one of my favorite passages in Scripture is Ephesians 2, the first two verses of verse 4. The first few verses of Ephesians 2 say what sorry no goods we are. And then verse 4 starts, but God, being rich in mercy and the love that he loved us with, did all this stuff for us, okay? God knew. He knew what you needed. He knew what you didn't need. He knew what sent. There it is. But God. That's what you're saying, well, basically, right? Moving on. Because i got more stuff to do. But your brain should be hurting even more right now, right? The fact that my brain hurts to me, means I should be humble. Humiliation is not a bad thing if it, if it makes me understand my relationship to God the right way. It's okay to be humbled. God is truth. God's truthfulness. God is, in fact, the standard of truth. Uh, two verses, two volunteers. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. 
Hebrews 6, 17, and 18. Proverbs 3. Yeah, some of you guys have got that memorized too. It's one of the ones we memorized in Sunday school when I was a little kid. Five and six. Trust, trust what he says. It's true. Hebrews 6, 17 and 18. Hold fast to the hope set you for, because God said it, and it's true. God cannot lie about stuff. There was a song back when I was a kid. God said it, I believe it, and that settled it for me. That song is wrong. God said it, and that settles it whether I believe it or not. <laughs> back in the ancient days, there was uh, philosophers uh, pondered the question, Greek philosophers, is, is piety what God is, what the, the gods are, or are the gods pious? Okay? That's something for philosophers to argue about. I don't care. But is truth true because God never lies? Or is truth true because it's what God said? That makes sense? Does God tell the truth? Or is truth truth because God tells it? I think it's the second. I think God is the source of and the measure of truth. If God says something, it is true, not because it aligns with, with perceived reality, but because God created the reality. He, he can't lie. It's true because he said it. Does that make sense? I think it's a, it's a nuanced concept, but I think if you understand it that way, it changes your perspective of how you, you look at God. God is not... God is not within the creation, okay, and, and, and lining up with it. In fact, it's the exact opposite. The creation is from God, and it lines up the way he lines it up. There is a particular heresy called open theism. You all heard of open theism? Any of you all? Some of you? Open theism, basically, they, they would not say it this way. They would say it has to do with free will. But I think open theism, the, the grief of it is that it puts God inside creation. Open theists would say that God cannot know the future for sure because it hasn't happened yet. Okay? Well, God is outside of time. He created the space-time continuum from nothing. And so it doesn't matter to him that it hasn't happened yet. He can see it all from outside. I can't even comprehend that fully. I can understand what the words mean, and I can see how it affects me, but I can't really understand what that, what that even means. The open theists don't have a big enough view of God. My view of God is much bigger than theirs. Mine's not big enough either because I can't possibly hold one that's big enough. I wish I could. Almost every heresy about God makes God merely Superman. I don't mean the guy in the, capes, in, the, in, the, in the cape and the tights. I mean man expanded, man greater. Uh, so I forget who it just popped into my head. Somebody said, somebody is famous for saying, I can't remember who it was, God created man in his own image and man has returned to favor. Voltaire? Okay. Voltaire said that. So, so Cody says, I believe he knows what he's talking about. Man has, was Cody, wasn't it? Somebody with a deep voice in the back said that. Oh, no, it was, okay. Sorry, Cody. Cody didn't know it was Voltaire. <laughs> I believe you know what you're talking about. Uh, now I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> you shouldn't do that to me. Uh, God is not, from a man's point of view, okay, if, if you're so proud, as, and I, I'm the kind of guy that believes that I should be able to understand everything. I believe I'm the smartest guy in every room that I'm in, whether it's true or not. And it's not true in this room. I can I got proof that it's not 
We won't go there because I don't want to. But, yeah, Voltaire. Uh, but I can't understand things. Some things that I can't understand, but, I, but it's my pride to believe that I can. There's nothing, but if I let that pride rule me, which is a sin, right? Then I will create in my mind a God which is merely a superman. I will have created God in my image. No. God created us as vague reflections of him. Vague images. That, that we, we image him, but we're not him. We're not like him. He's other. He's different. We've already talked about how much bigger he is than us. Bigger than we can even possibly understand. After we've been in heaven 100 million years, bigger than we can possibly understand. Okay, that was another digression. Voltaire. Besides being uh, uh, omniscient and truthful, God is wise. Wisdom is the practical use of knowledge. My definition is it's skill in decision making. A wise man is someone who makes the right decisions over and over again. Okay? Uh, a quick look through the story of Job. I'm just going to give you this. I've got the verses written down, but I'm just going to give you. You know the story of Job? In the beginning of the story of Job, uh, it's, it's, it seems in heaven, and Satan is there, and God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Now, he's upright. There's nobody like him. And Satan says, he's not upright for nothing. You give him all this good stuff for being upright. And God says, go test him. Just don't touch his body. So, boom. All his kids are dead. All his stuff is gone. He just, he's sitting there poor and with nothing left but a nagging wife and friends that tell him it's his fault. And he doesn't sin. And then Satan says, well, you know, sure, anybody can, he's, he, but he's got his health. You know, so he's okay. Still, he's still trusting you because you've given him his health. Okay, take his health. Just don't kill him. Satan says, okay, I got him now. He makes him physically miserable. I know what physical misery can be. Okay? Job was much worse shaped than me. He didn't have a cast. He didn't have a doctor that could fix his arm. He was just miserable. And for like 35 chapters, his best friends come to him and tell him how it's his fault. He must have sinned. He must have done something. It's your fault, Job. God does not do this kind of stuff for no reason. Okay? Job says, no, I didn't. I, I'm, I've been upright. I've done everything that God asked of me. I've done everything right. I, I don't deserve this. At the end of the book, in starting like in uh, chapter 40, after he'd been through, through 40 chapter, 39 chapters of this, in, verse, in chapter 40, Job is talking to God and he says, what? Why are you doing this? And God says, Job, who do you think you are? He goes through chapter 40 and chapter 41 saying, examples. Did, did you, where were you when I, did you, can you do this? Just, just who do you think you are asking questions of me? And Job says, you know what? I'm just going to shut up now. I, mm, mm. And God says, no, I'm going to ask what you're going to answer. And he goes through another chapter of, bam, Job, who do you think, why, what could you, com comparing him to, to God? And Job says, look, I already said, I'm, I just, I got nothing. I got nothing. Nothing. And God says, okay, now, you, now the lesson is out there now. You got nothing. Us, me, I got nothing. I got nothing compared to God. Wisdom. God knew all that was going on. Job at the end of the book never knew about what happened in chapter 1. He's read it now, I suppose. <laughs> but he never knew then. God was wise enough to know the right way to treat Job, the right way to deal with Satan, the right way to explain it all to us so that it would work to our benefit with a good story. It's a good story. It's one of my favorite books of the Bible, even though it's long, and much of it is very depressing because it's Job's friends telling him what a sorry no good he is when he wasn't. But he must have been. It, Moving right along. God is not fathomable by any man, certainly not by Job or his friends, or by any group of men. He has wisdom beyond our ability. Jeremiah 10. Let's look this one up. Jeremiah 10, verses 12 and 13. Who's going to read that for me? Jeremiah 10, 
Jeremiah 10 verses, where is my note? Verses uh, 12 and 13. Somebody else? <coughs> okay. Amanda. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 and 25. Jeremiah 10, you got it? Jeremiah 10. 12 and 13. God is wise in... Have you finished? No. Finished. Read, read some more. We need more. He makes lightning for the rain, and he brings forth the wind from his storehouse. Every wind is stupid in your house. <laughs> Comparatively. Yes, true. God is wise in creation. Can you just imagine? I mean, I could not... Right now, go build a, a computer from, from composite atoms. I think eventually I could figure out how to do that. I worked my entire career in IT, and I can tell you, compared to humans, compared to mice, computers are stupid. Computers really only do two things. They, they, they remember and they add. That's really all they can do. So compared to any, and, and I, I could work really hard and get myself educated to the point where I could build a computer out of composite minerals and stuff, I think. God made all this. There's a couple of, uh, of video series that Louis Giglio put out, I think is mostly for high school kids. One of them is looking at the microscope, looking at the at cells and at the small things and how wonderfully created it is and how you really can't imagine. And the other one is looking with a telescope out at the, at, the, at the stars, at the universe, and how wonderful, and you really can't even imagine. If you haven't studied that, you, really, you have no, it's, it's more than you can, it's more than you think, it's more there than you think there is. God made all that. He's wise. He did, he did it, and it all works. I mean, most of the computers that I made would probably not work until I finally got one working, but God made the first time. Boom, it's, it's perfect. In his life. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. 18 to 25. For the word of the cross is folly to those who think who are perishing. But to us who are saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will pour the words that are divine. And the stone of his turning I will pour. There is one who is wise. Where, wait, where is one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand a sign, and the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. God is wise in redemption. The gospel is wisdom. The foolishness of man is foolish. But God's least wise stuff is better than we got. God is wise in creation. He is wise in redemption. He is wise, I meaning he makes good decisions. His decisions are, are trustworthy. I find the wisdom for me still is defined as skill in decision making. Proverbs, I encourage you to look at Proverbs. I think that a lot of you got a reading plan that you read a different, different book of Proverbs, a different chapter of Proverbs every day. That's a good one. Uh, Proverbs has got all the kind of, you, you will gain wisdom personally. Uh, you'll never be a patch on God, but that's okay. You'll, you'll be better than you were the day before. Next, holiness. God is not like us. He is other, unfathomable, unfathomable, transcendent and pure. In Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 5, it's, that's where Isaiah, it ends up with who will go for us. Isaiah says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I can't approach God. Oh my goodness. Well, I, I, I got, he's, he's like Job. He's like, I got nothing. I can't do this. And God says, no. The, the seraphim comes to him and, and ceremonially cleans him. 
with the like by, by burning his lips with a coal, right? Maybe it didn't burn. I don't know. We can't really understand that, but Isaiah understood that God was holy. He was transcendent, and he was not. God is not like us. He is other. He is different. Transcendent means, what does transcendent mean? Surely I've got that written down here somewhere. I don't. Transcendent means beyond our our sphere, beyond our, it's, 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 it is outside, it's, it's different, other, not like us. At the, at the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, some of the disciples got to see an image of the transcendent Christ. Uh, in some place in the Old Testament, it says if you see the transcendent God, you can't handle it to the point where it will kill you. He's not like us, he's other, he is holy, unfathomable, pure. The seraphim in, in Isaiah 6 cover their faces and say, holy, holy, holy. Isaiah says, woe to me, because it's obvious that he's not qualified to approach God, and yet God is irresistible to Isaiah. He's there in the throne room, and he says, I am irresistibly drawn to God, and yet it is not theoretically possible, as far as I can tell, for me to approach him. And then God makes a way for Isaiah to approach him, and God says, to the, to the groom, who will go for us? And Isaiah says, Isaiah says, oh man, please, pick me. That's God's holiness transcendence exemplified in a, in a, in a story of what, what happened, of how Isaiah got chosen. God is beautiful, just for starters, because of his perfect love, seen in the Trinity and seen towards us. You can see God's perfect love in the Trinity towards each other and towards us as God's love flows out of his love for each other to us. Holiness. Next, justice and righteousness. I think that justice and righteousness stems from God's triune love for his creation. His, the way he loved the Holy Spirit and the Son and the way they loved each other overflowed into God's love for his creation and then the creation became marred. And so what is God going to do? If he's, He has to, to, to do something with that. He has to punish evil. He has to punish sin. And he has to redeem. Or he's, he decides to anyway. So God's justice and righteousness comes out of his love. One of the reasons why I like delighting in the Trinity and then the, the concept of, of the Trinity being important to, the, to these other aspects, other uh, attributes of God is you kind of understand what's going on better than you could if you just said, you know, yeah, God is just and God is righteous. Well, you can understand how that's true because God's love for himself in the Trinity and God's love overflowing out of that into us requires justice and righteousness because sin. Let's look at some verses there too. If God did not love us, he would have no need to right wrongs. Because God loves us and justice must be satisfied, he made a way so that his love would be in harmony with his righteousness and justice. Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. Somebody read that for me. Who's going to do that? Brent Casey's going to read that. Romans 5, 6, 8. Romans 3. Say you want to volunteer or else I'm going to volunteer you. Romans 3, 23 to 26. Okay, and my favorite passage in the scripture probably is Ephesians 2, 1 to 11. Samuel's got it back there. Romans 5. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. But perhaps a good person, for a good person one would dare to even die. But God shows his love for us in in that while we were still sinners, God, Christ died for us. The just for the unjust. Why would he do that? Justice demands punishment. Love demands redemption. How does he make those things work together? 
He is completely just and completely righteous, and he, and he proves that by sending us this method of redemption. Romans 3, 23 to 26. 23 to 26, yeah. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because of his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Lays it out for I couldn't say it any better. God shows his righteousness by his love for us in that he sent his, and in that, in, in that the gospel, in that he sent his son for us. Shows that he's righteous, shows that he's just, shows that he's love, shows that those things really aren't at odds with each other. In the beginning I said God's attributes do not contradict each other. They're not pieces of God that, that work it. They, work, they, they, they fit together really well. Ephesians 2, 1 to 11, Samuel. I think you. I think you. I think that's that's twelve, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I probably did. Sorry about that. You can handle it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> this Ephesians two is one of my favorites. Ten, fifteen. It's, it's ten o'clock. Okay, thank you. I think I might even actually make it. I only got like half a page left. This show, the first. A couple of verses are how sorry no goods we are. And then God's love for us created a way, and now we respond to that love for us by doing the work that he laid out in advance for us. Justice, love, righteousness, it all fits together. It's all part of God's plan. It's all part of God's personality in a way that is indivisible. It's just, it's just beautiful to me. I mean, I, you can have all kinds of God's justice stuff in Old Testament and God putting a hammer on people, and, but no. The justice and the righteousness of God is best shown through the cross. Like almost everything is best shown through the cross. Goodness and love. Is God good because he, did good, because he does, does good things? Or is goodness good because God does it? Same argument as, as I had before, right, about truth. God is not good because he does good things. God defines good. Good things are good because God says they are. Okay? He's not like us. He is other. He is high. He is transcendent. We cannot grasp him. God always does what is best. Romans eight twenty eight. Somebody got that memorized? I know somebody has it. Got that. Romans 8, 28 memorized. Look it up then. Somebody look it up. Right. That's, yeah. God always does what is best. Everything works together for good for those called according to his purpose. God is good to all through common grace. Psalm 147 talks about all the good stuff that God has given everybody, not just Christians, 
not just the, his followers, but the world. God has given that to everybody, and it's all the good stuff. He brings the sun up every morning. He makes it rain. It was raining when you came, right? That's good. The grass doesn't grow unless there's rain. We don't have wheat. We don't have stuff to eat unless it rains. Even those of us who like meat, that meat's got to eat something or else we wouldn't have it. God gave that to everybody, not just Christians. God gives grace to the undeserving. What Sam we just read Ephesians 2. We don't deserve God's grace, and yet he gives it to us in a way that we can't really even comprehend. I wouldn't do it. Romans 5, uh, 5, 8, 6, 7, 8, that, that Brent read a minute ago. You know, maybe, some, maybe for somebody that's good enough, I would be willing to give my life. Maybe. It's probably not. Maybe. But, I mean, you know, Secret Service men stand in front of a bullet for the president, right? They're special. But God did it for us when we were in rebellion against him. God is the Secret Service man that stood in front of Hitler to take his bullet. Because that's how we were to God. I, it's goodness and love. God has all that. The key that I want you to understand there, though, is that God does not do good, and that makes him God. God defines good. Good is good because God does it. Okay? Conclusion. When all has been said and done, fear God and keep his commands. This is a whole, no, that's a different thing altogether. That's God's attributes reveal his transcendence, his otherness, his greatness, his glory, and his immanence, his presence with us. Between transcendence and immanence, we've got everything that we need to know. Now, God is more than that, more than we can comprehend, but we've got everything we need. We tend to think of immanence, God's presence with us, more than we do of transcendence, but I think that's a mistake. I think you need to have a really, really high view of God, recognizing that you cannot possibly understand it. That's my second one thing, right? I wish I could... This really should have been two lessons so I could have two one things. First one thing is the Trinity and the way that the Trinity makes everything make more sense. Okay? God could be God without it, but he's not. He's God with it, and it makes it, he did it for us to be able to kind of understand things about him that we otherwise would have no chance of understanding. We still can't fully get it, but we don't. And God is bigger than you can imagine. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. In light of all that, why would anyone, why would I, why would you be tempted to place your affections in anything else? It's like Isaiah said in, uh, I forget where that passage was. He was drawn irresistibly to God. God was so beautiful, so great, so wonderful. He, and yet he knew he didn't have the standing to even be where he was, much less go to God, until God came in and cleansed him, purified him. It's the gospel all over again. Why would, remember how I said in the beginning, you know, back when I was in college, I made a study of all this. Why would you do anything else? Why would you go anywhere else? Why would you care about any, he's God. He's God. Any quick questions? Transcendence and immanence. I M M A N E N C E, right, Brent? <laughs> immanence. It means it means presence with us. Uh, uh, Emmanuel means God with us, right? It's the same root. Immanence, Emmanuel. It's God, God's presence with us. Transcendence means God being beyond our ability to to grasp or understand. Okay. You got to, oh, yeah, I should have been ready for that question. <laughs> how can theology, and how can this, this theology inform our doxology? You remember that from last time? Theology informs doxology that knowing about God gives us a greater ability to praise Him? Well, I mean, 
He's transcendent, right? How, I mean, for me, it's like, It's the Isaiah right. It's, it's, it's like a, I don't know that you have to actually address that. Oh, yeah, he asked the question. I have to address it. <laughs> but I think, I'm, I think the whole thing has been addressing it, right? God is so great, and, and, he is, and, and through the Trinity, he has given us the ability to, to have some level of understanding of all of this stuff and how it fits together in a way that's just beautiful. It's just transcendent. How can you not? How can it? How can it do anything else except inform your doxology? Except that some people don't have an exchange for doxology. Some people don't, and 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 my best analysis of that syndrome is that that happens when people have so much pride in their own intellect that they think they can. Under, they, they think that if I just study enough, I can understand it. Well, if you get to there, you. You're toast. You're already. You're. You're, you're going to be a heretic in the long run. You don't have any. So, that answer your question? Yeah. Now everybody's going to be thinking of that movie instead of what I just said for the last hour. <laughs> she doesn't even remember what movie it comes from. But <laughs> Spider Man. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. That's what I've done for the last hour, okay? I, I really can't do it any shorter length of time than that. I'll say, okay, God claims, God says he is one essence. God says he is three persons. That is, it's not comprehensible by man, and I can show you there are a lot of things that are not comprehensible by man. I started off with orders of infinity. That's just the simplest one I've got. If you look at that, at the, at Louis Giglio's thing about the universe and about the microverse, there are a lot of things that people don't understand. Lots. So the fact that I can't understand something doesn't shouldn't mean that I can't use knowledge about it. That's the way I would attack any, any uh, theologian that uh, says I'm a polytheist. And indeed, Islam does say that Christians are polytheists. So they don't understand. I don't understand it. I can't expect them to understand it. They don't even believe in God, really. Their God's not, not our God. Our God died for us. Their God wants them to die for Him. Are you coming for? You got to say something. Say something. Or you? Okay. I'll give it to you. <laughs> 